warm good evening to all the viewers of Michael and One India. Uh, today we have a very special guest, a special individual who is uh, full of positive adjectives, a brave heart, a fighter, inspirational, witty, uh, and the list will go on. And like a real fighter, she also had to go through a lot of obstacles in life. Uh, not that she didn't feel the pain. She felt the pain, accepted the pain, and moved on, and moved on really well to be doing some great stuff in life uh, at the moment. Uh, back in 2012, uh, uh, when she was on a holiday in Cambodia, Cambodia, uh, when she was uh, uh, expecting, uh, uh, and she was also celebrating her fourth anniversary, uh, expecting a job promotion as well. That's when she had to uh, suffer a bacterial infection, uh, which uh, led to her losing her baby. And also that also led to the unfortunate uh, incident of her losing uh, for her four limbs. But hold on, uh, she uh, since then uh, she has rediscovered herself. She has a new innings to her life. And uh, when she started running, she uh, that was for general fitness and health, uh, which led to her completing the TCS uh, 10K marathon in 2017. And uh, um, then she went on to become the national silver medalist and national gold medalist at the national para games in 100 meter sprint. And uh, at the Asian games at Hangzhou uh, in 2023, uh, she was she also held the Asian record for the fastest women on blades in the T62 category. Uh, apart from that, she also has been um, uh, doing her corporate talks at uh, big corporate houses like Biocon, uh, Tesco, Xiaomi, Dell, Microsoft, Wipro, and many others. Welcome to our show, uh, Shalini Saraswati. Thank you so much for taking all the time. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks. Thanks, Shalini. So, of course, there, there's a lot to chat, chat about you, about uh, your journey so far. But first of all, uh, on a positive note, um, your experience at the Hangzhou uh, Asian Games, I'm sure, you know, uh, that must have been uh, some of the best days of your life uh, as an athlete. Because, uh, you know, uh, you've got to meet so many different athletes, uh, different countries, uh, uh, totally different environment, uh, you know, away from uh, the home country, uh, there, somewhere uh, there, and then meeting all, all those, uh, you know, different athletes, sharing uh, different experiences. How was it like? It was absolutely, I think, the uh, like the cherry on the cake, I would say. Yes, like, yes, um, it was absolutely a life experience especially for someone who comes from an absolutely non-sporting -sport background, right? Like, it's not like I was ever into sports or any of that. So um, I got into sports as well post my disability. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, no reference points. And, uh, you know, you've, you've, it, I it never, when I was able-bodied, ever thought of being at any athletic event. So uh, from there to then transition to be at the Asian Games was... Uh, was absolutely awesome and it was great to be able to represent the country um uh, the experience of having to meet so many people in different countries and different athletes and i think the experience is also when uh, it's people with disabilities i think it's a lot more different than able bodied athletes as well um and uh, it was just it was nice i mean you know it was just like one big family you're meeting people uh, you're talking to random people and we they had this um this i never knew this this you have these india tags you you're given these um clip-on tags right so the yeah. whole thing is that you try and exchange it with other countries and you oh. get on your tag as many other countries as possible so it's like almost like you're you're like these drug dealers in different places where you're like <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> saying you know yeah. i have this do you want this or not so okay. uh, you know I, I you you end up having a lot more of conversations with a lot more of people yeah. because you want as many badges as possible right yeah. so uh and i and i and i kind of got a lot of countries on so i think i i more than the running i actually enjoyed that absolutely yeah of course yeah yeah, I mean, talking about uh, that as well. I mean, how was your preparation like? Like you said, you you, you were a non-athlete to start off uh, with. Then you you know evolved as an athlete, so to say. So how was the preparation like? Because going into a big event, no matter what, even though you know you didn't have, might not have that many expectations from yourself because you just evolved as an athlete. Of course, by now you are uh, more pro than ever. So how was the preparation like? I mean, on what term did you really prepare? I think see, it took me. It took me. Um, I started my like to even start trying to run like the first time I ever went to Kantirwa Stadium in Bangalore is in, yeah. in April 2014 oh, okay. um, that's when I um, I mean I had prosthetic legs and when I got 
um there and i met my coach bp ayappa mm-hmm. um the the i don't think we ever thought about running at all it was just to be able to make sure that i could walk back right mm-hmm. it just mm-hmm. kind of accomplished the very basic things in life um and then we kind of figured we could run and uh, we started to run and we did the tcs like you said earlier we did the tcs in two consecutive years over 16 and 17 oh really okay and um and and that was when we got the blades and then you know coach said that we should try professionally and when i started out i don't think para athletics was as big as it is today yeah. um you know it was still a very nascent uh, sporting field people were still figuring out what it was so i kind of got i think i got a bit lucky because i was one of the people that were there at the start of it oh okay and um and uh, you know and i was also one of the only blade runners uh, in india and the yeah. only quad amputee even in asia that ran mm-hmm. um okay. so you know you the most amount of disability people had like even uh, at asian games were a single leg amputee so there wasn't oh. anyone that ran with me so i think um the whole experience of training to get to that point has been very different because um a was that coach uh, himself had never trained a person with a disability right he was never into para sports yes, so we had to really adapt from like even coach had to learn how to teach someone to yeah. run on blades so we yes, had to yes. do go back to a lot of research in terms of what other people were doing oh. what they look like um you know we went through various phases of trying to get something for the hand support to kind of do my start so we went through various stages trying to figure out how we could even start running right like especially as a 100 meter sprinter your so, start is very important yes start is very important so it's very important so you know we really struggled with because there was no way i could do a block start with both my hands pinned down which is what okay. most people do yes, yes, because so. again i had a parity disparity in the way my hand length were um so you know we made something where i could rest my hand um from there we then kind of transitioned to various techniques and then we found um and uh, some video of someone who just stood straight into that and then we said okay we're going to try that so it's been a very trial and error kind of a process for us right where we've learned unlearned um uh, things over a period in time um and uh, you know i then went on to uh, peak performance uh, which is my sports and physio place that i work yeah. with and then you know i had a whole lot of people then that did a lot more of research in terms of how do you train a person with a disability what exercises i could do so it's been a lot of work for the people that have worked with me as well right so uh, it's been intensive it's been a lot of training and it took me what it took me it took me 9 years to get to the point to go to asian games oh really so oh. um mm-hmm. it was 9 years of being at it every single day it's about yeah. being at practice every single day um and uh, we did a lot of Uh, we did a couple of international competitions as well we did dubai we did sharja we did china so um we peppered that and we did all of the indian competitions as well so the prep has pretty much been um a lot of exploratory it has been a lot of trying to understand what we could do and what we cannot do um and then over a period in time i think we found other people with prosthetics and you know we've tried to learn and adapt from them as well um so it's been a lot of intense hard work and tears and um and falling and uh, all of that as well to, to learn through right um so yeah it was tough but it was worth every bit of that i would say i'm sure i'm sure yes it's one uh, of a lifetime or a moment right for you yeah sure yeah absolutely absolutely yes yes now talking about uh, the paris olympics i mean para olympics that is uh, still on um, how much do you yes yes so how much do you think we have evolved as a country of course we have got uh, some great athletes you know world record have hold mm-hmm. sumit anthil in javelin then we've got somebody like uh, avani uh, uh, you know uh, para shooting then we've got krishna nagar in para badminton of course you know also, also they, uh, earlier we had deepa you know uh, so yes. we've got a lot of uh, good world class in you know, a para athlete so to say but how much do you think you have evolved of course the lot goes I around absolutely yeah. think it's it, like i in my own like through my own eyes i'm seeing yeah. how much i think there's a lot more of um, funding that is going in there there's yeah. a lot mm-hmm. more and i think with the para athletes winning more medals than the able bodied athletes in in paris or in asian games has really brought the sport yes, to yes. the forefront yes. and i think there are a lot more of people with disabilities wanting to give a try at it which i think is great and i also see like in terms of how the nationals are held to the various i think we've gotten cleaner slicker over a period in time 
Um, and today, I think the 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 issue is that I think we're far more people with disabilities competing to want to get there. So, which I think is a is a good problem to have. Um, and I and I've seen how it has evolved over a period in time. Like I've seen it over the last. Uh, I ran my first official uh, race, I think, in twenty seventeen. Uh, that was the first time I ran the nationals, and when I compare that to what happened maybe in 2022, I think it's far more well organized. It's um, you have a lot more clarity in terms of um, um, what categories you belong to. I think you know earlier it was a lot of speculation in terms of what category you'd belong to, and that's the crux of para athletics, right? Um, I think it's a little more organized, and people kind of know. And I think with the constant exposure that people are having to it. Um, I think it's evolved, and and of course we have a long way to go as well. Uh, but I think uh, we, you know, sh sh surely uh, we're heading in the right direction. Yes, yes, really, you know, uh, glad to know about that because it's high time that you know we evolve uh, overall as a sporting nation, be it uh, you know able body Olympics or uh, para Olympics. Uh, you know, that's the way to go. Uh, coming uh, coming out of your, um, uh, I mean, of sports a little bit, and coming to general life. I mean, life in general. Uh, how much do you think India as a country has evolved in terms of, uh, uh, you know, disabled people, you know, getting uh, uh, getting the inclusiveness in a society? I'm talking about inclusivity in a society in terms of they getting government jobs. Of course, it, it could also uh, lead to a, a very uh, basic thing like a seating arrangement in a park or maybe in a bus. How much do you think uh, we have really evolved when it comes to inclusiveness as a society for, for disabled people out here in India? Of course, there's still some way to go, but uh, how much do you think? Some way, a lot, a lot, a lot, lot, lot I'm sure, yes. Infrastructure-wise, I don't think we're anywhere close to where we need to be, right? Like, mm -hmm. if you're talking about public transport today, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think anybody with a disability can today uh, confidently get onto a bus or a train and travel. Yeah. Uh, I think there's really a long distance to go there. I think uh, infrastructure in terms of, like, cities and maybe some buildings uh, a lot of corporate organizations um you know the ramps and all of that is there so you know those are probably a bit more accessible but i also feel it's it's a function of privilege um it's of if you are in an affluent family and you oh. come from a certain amount of yeah. money and have yeah. that then i think it becomes easier as a person with a disability to get your life around and go but the stark reality today be uh, is that a large percentage of people with disabilities are in the rural areas and are absolutely disenfranchised and i don't think they have the infrastructure that they need or even let's forget infrastructure i don't think they have access to uh, prosthetics or orthotic devices i don't think they okay. have um, access to schools, um, you know, one of the most basic things, or even uh, to the healthcare systems, right? So today I work, I work for Rise Bionics, and we're in the space of making orthotics and prosthetic devices. And um, one of the things that you know we we have CSR programs, and I see the one of the things that we're trying to today give is give free prosthetics away to children with disabilities. And the thing that we're trying, we're really struggling, is to find these children. Not that they don't exist today, uh -oh. but the point is that they're so dis this uh, en yeah. uh, enfranchised that we, we we're not able to. Uh, they're not even in the system for us to track them around. Um, so I think definitely there's so much more to go, and this a uh, really a long distance and. Of course, a social stigma that is there as well, right? Culturally as well. Um, we're, we're not very open to having people with disabilities and we're definitely looking at them as more a burden uh, uh, than being empowered in individuals. And I think that comes with, and you backtrack that it goes back to being having an education and being financially independent, neither of which are, being hap are happening. So the minute that too is out of the picture, there is no way you can be empowered if, you do, if you're not financially independent. Um, so I definitely think that there's a huge space uh, that needs to be filled in there. Uh, I think the policies to a large extent are there, but I, I think the proof of the pudding is always in its eating. I don't think we're able to uh, deploy those policies as, as well as they should be, right? Um, there are policies to say that, you know, you have to give jobs to people with disabilities and, you know, there have been so many, and, I'm, and I think there have been places as well where I've read that those roles which are opened up for people with disabilities are intentionally kept open. So, the, and, and after a period in time, they're filled with able-bodied people. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I think um, I, I think those are problems. So, policy-wise, I think the policies are there. But I think implementation, we have a really long way to go. Uh, now, talking about the prosthetic uh, implants, the blade uh, that, uh, you know, athletes like you use, 
Um, one is that how do you actually source the thing and also secondly for example i play tennis you know uh, so basically uh, the rackets that is used by a power heater for example that's uh, different from somebody who uses a lot of spin or soft spin you know so likewise do you have different uh, again sorry from ignorance um, again do you have uh, different uh, prosthetic uh, uh, implants in terms of uh, the body type say for example of course it's uh, depends on the potential and the bounce and stuff like that or is it uh, regular for almost everybody no, so your prosthetic, um, the the it's it's weight driven, right? Uh, so there are different kinds of prosthetics, and they will choose a prosthetic basis your weight. That's the first one that goes through. And of course, the first question that your prosthetics mm -hmm. really asks you is, what kind of usage do you want, right? Okay. Um, so do you want to just walk? Do you want it to be essentials? Uh, do you plan to be a heavy user? Do you want to use it for sports? So I think the prosthetics vary from. Uh, each version of that, right? So your prosthetics vary in terms of costs, uh, basis where you want to be. So even in terms of blades, uh, what you would use for running will be very different to uh, a blade that you might use for javelin, for example. The requirements are very different uh, okay. uh, because you might need to pivot when you mm -hmm. do a javelin oh, okay. or, um, uh, or or throw um, uh, a discus or any of that, right? They have the, they need to have the pivoting. But when if you're a, a prosthetic, if you're wearing a prosthetic. Uh, for running, it's to ensure that you're moving uh, forward. So uh, obviously, the prosthetics are very different, and there are and they and they come in varied types, forms, etc. Uh, but they are extremely expensive. So it's not something that uh, a lot of people in India can afford. Um, and I think that is one of also one of the biggest challenges that we yes. have today yes. uh, with being able to give allow allowing people to have a dignified life for person with a disability is purely a factor of um, that it comes at a very big expense and it's not something most families can afford. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, so even with your uh, prosthetic legs, uh, you know, the, the ones you can have something with torsion, you can have um, a lateral, they can allow you to climb stairs, they don't, then you have the very basic Jaipur leg, which is given away in India, which is basic oh. wooden legs. Yes, yes. So um, I think it all varies from uh, 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 what your usage is and what your weight is. And obviously, you know, they, they recommend basis what that needs to be from uh, different companies. Yeah. So in, in India, yeah. in terms of manufacturers, mm -hmm. I think there is just one or few companies that do that. Uh, the most high-end uh, prosthetics that you can buy and which you would see that most of the athletes that use are typically Acer or Autobox. And that's German and Icelandic companies. Um, okay. So, you know, that's what most of us in India use if you have the money that is. Oh, okay, okay. <clears throat> I guess, uh, again, with the import duty and stuff like that, I guess where that's where. Yeah, and yeah. and and the most and the most ter terrible part is that we have GST on them, uh, which, that again, is, is yeah. a ridiculous thing for us to do policy-wise because here is a, a prosthetic device. It's not a luxury. Yeah. It's uh, a and, you know, people should be allowed to have... <clears throat> I think that, that the policy level, to pay yes, yes. I guess a lot has to change the policy level. Uh, that's when you know things will change that and automatically. Sure. I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. And talking about the training, uh, uh, I guess you uh, train at peak performance, Yash Pandey. Uh, I do both. Yeah, I do train at peak performance. I train with the Pali Pandey. Oh, okay. um, the, better half, the better half, the better half of Yash Pandey, yes, yes, yes. Okay. and um, mm. and uh, yes, and I and I have my trainers as well. I have Pavan as well as Harish mm. that I train with. Um, so it's like a team. There are the three of them and they take turns to kind of make my life as miserable as they possibly can. <laughs> uh, and yeah. uh, then I and I train with BPI up at Kandir who's my um, who's my sprinting coach. Right, right. right. So uh, typically, um, what would be your training um, schedule? I mean, how do you, I'm sure it's a little bit different from a regular training, right? So how do you actually mm -hmm. approach, uh, maybe you approach uh, uh, when you are towards uh, the fag end of a tournament, I guess your training schedule also changes. But typically, uh, yeah. in, in a normal day, how do you approach your training? Um, because one is your regular training at peak performance, which is strength and, uh, you know. Yeah, I do uh, the thrice a week. Okay. I do the strength and, strength and conditioning happens thrice a week, which is the Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Oh, okay. And the other three days, which is the Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturdays at Kanteva Stadium. Oh. So the running's on those four days. Okay. Um, but like we said, like if you're, if you're, you know, if you're getting competition ready, then it's very intense and mm -hmm. um, it's yeah. hardcore, right? Because you're you're training to run better. You're training to make sure you have better strength training. Uh, you're you're focusing on particular muscle groups. You're focusing on your glutes. 
you're focusing on your quads and your mm. hamstrings to make sure that you can run better, right? That's, it becomes very intensive like that uh, when you're doing strength and conditioning um, because you focus completely on making sure that you get power with your legs to be able to propel forward. And of course, your arms as well. And then for me, it's additional because we uh, because I use the blades, we do a lot of um, functional training uh -huh. uh, to be able to hold your core, to be mm. able to balance better. Uh, <clears throat> because as you're uh, on a blade, especially when you are increasing at very high intensity, especially what will happen is that even a little bit of wind can shake you up. Yeah, so it's very yeah. important to have very good stre uh, core strength uh, and having better yeah. stability as well. Mm -hmm. um, because that's the only way you can control the blades, uh, the uh, the blades, right? Then for the blades to control you, it becomes very important for you to be able to control the blades. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, yeah, yeah. So that means you, you've got no off day. I mean, uh, both peak performance. Yeah, you don't right? have. And <laughs> yeah, and, and and you also want to make sure that you're not falling flat on your face. <laughs> yeah, true, true, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, now, um, talking about, uh, I mean, I, I know, I know whatever you're doing, you're, you're doing it for yourself and rightly so. We all do, uh, uh, you know, whatever we do, we do it for ourselves. But at time, I'm sure, uh, for example, at peak performance, when you're tra training for yourself, uh, somebody, you know, uh, uh, again, he's entitled to feel tired. He might, you know, sit in some corner and then you just take some rest and then might get inspired by you. Okay, you know, uh, she's still doing it. Does it put a little bit of pressure at all certain times? You know, even though it's a positive pressure, but I'm sure, you know, uh, we but are. Me? Yeah, yeah. That, okay. You know, no, some... I, there's no pressure on me. It's always the other people that are more pressure than I am. <laughs> um, because, you know, it, it's easy. I'm a person with a disability. I can always sit down and say, listen, this is so tiring. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, no, like I think I have a great team at Peak Performance and uh, um, I don't think I, they give me an option to say that it is not possible. Oh, okay. um, and I think it's what, what I really love there as well is the fact that they give keep it very varied. They understand what my needs are mm -hmm. and uh, there's a lot of option in terms of what we want to do. And there's a lot of thinking that goes in as well. So if you look at the videos that I have on uh, Instagram as well, yeah, yeah. it's a lot of adaptation. It's things that we have done. So I remember like two weeks back, I was training with uh, with my trainer and they had a new person that had joined in. Uh -huh. And we did one session where we did weights and we did like a lot of hardcore things. And uh, the new girl uh, then turned around and said, you know, I was thinking that how are you going to be able to do all this? And I'm, and I'm thinking like, I, I didn't know that we could do all this with you. Oh. So I think like, and, and I was saying that, you know, we've transitioned over the last six, seven odd years, even at peak with how we started our exercises to then mm -hmm. figuring out how much we could push myself. Yeah. Um, so I don't think, and I don't think people around me also are pressured, I think. I think we're we're fairly yeah. okay. Um, I think we 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 give off good energy to each other, and uh, and sometimes you're just there to do your own thing, right? Yeah. Um, the rest of it really doesn't I mean, matter. Yes, yes. So I mean, uh, by default, the environment that is created is uh, good for everyone around. So that's yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. True, true. So I mean, you are also at the same time a poet. Of course, you are an articulate person. Uh, you have uh, uh, you know um, uh, held a lot of corporate talks. So was it a uh, it, is it something that you already uh, always been doing right from your uh, school days, no. college days, or you evolved as a you know uh, you know over time? I mean, school yeah. and yeah, school and co I mean, school and uh, school and college. You know, you do your debating and yeah. you do your theater and you. Yeah. I mean, I was always on stage. Um, okay. I was, I, but I was more, I was more a singer and more a dancer and oh, okay. all of those things, like more arty. Okay. Um, than sporty. Okay. Um, my God, that rhymed. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> <point>. So, <laughs> uh, so you know, it was all that. And sports was very like I think you know, like I've always said this. Yeah, I was part of Blue House, mm -hmm. and uh, you ran. I, I, I think I did the relays and sticks, things like that in school. But you never ran in school because you were best. You were the best of yeah. the worst because nobody knew to do anything, right? Yes, yes. And you just had to get you had to get your points for your sports. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for your house, and I think it was just that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then. I think I did like um, I was again part of the volleyball team in school okay but I think even when we did the volleyball as well we only got into it because you know I, I studied in a convent so we were a girls only school mm -hmm. uh, so it's the only opportunity to go to another place and meet some boys I think it was just that and nothing more mm -hmm. than that right so mm -hmm. the, none of our intentions were mm -hmm. ever uh, were, were ever, 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 ever any good so I think we did so we just went in there to do and so we were all all my friends were on the team and it was just chalo we'll just go have fun kind of thing yeah. so it was never anything serious uh, at all 
um uh, so yeah why were we talking about this? Sorry, I forgot the question now. Uh, yeah, yeah, no. I'm, I'm talking about you being a poet and also being you being very oh, articulate and because, yeah. So, so, yeah, yeah. so I, I mean, being I'm being able to speak and being very articulate always came very naturally to me. Yeah, um, right. I've always loved reading, so mm -hmm. you know, I've loved, I've always loved um, the the words and mm -hmm. what it stands and you know all of that. Um, I don't think the speaking bit. Uh, it didn't come through like, you know, yes, at work and all of that, I've always gotten stage and it's not something that I'm nervous about. Mm. Um, after my disability and after the stories came out of the running, the yeah. first TCS mm -hmm. was when, you know, I came out in the newspapers and there was a big splash and, you know, oh, Facebook yeah. to this mm -hmm. and that and articles mm -hmm. and da -dee da -dee da yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I think I had um, a couple of people who reached out to me to say that, would you come out and speak to us? Um, and initially, I actually didn't want to because I just thought, um, you know, it, it, it's absolutely about going in, in front of a bunch of strangers and talking about the most um, vulnerable parts of your life and, and to lay it in front of a bunch of strangers about probably one of the most toughest times of your life is not the easiest thing to do. Um, and I remember uh, Amma telling me that um, don't do this for yourself. But you never know who in the audience really needs to hear your story. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I think yeah. that was one of yes. the primary reasons why I ever started out. Yeah, yeah. And I remember when I did my first conversation, I did it with Tesco. And um, I finished it and there were a lot of people that came and spoke to me. And then um, I had this two women who stayed back and they waited till everyone went. And then when they finished, they came out and said, can I give you a hug? And I said, of course. And uh, they said that I'm going through a really bad time in my life, but I feel like I can go back and deal with the rest of my life. And I felt that was the the teaching moment for me, right? That said that, um, yeah, you know, this kind of makes sense. Um, and then I love to talk. Um, so, you know, that kind of fitted in perfectly, right? Um, and then I got to make money as well out of it. So I'm like, mm -hmm. hey, uh, why would I not yeah, do this? Obviously. And then, of course, you get to stay in some fancy hotels and some of the <laughs> most five-star places. Yeah, yeah, uh, you can eat any food. You can order some of these um, desserts, which you can't even spell for heaven's sake. So those were all the additional perks of having to do that. So I thought, yeah, why not? Um, well, so uh, so it's been it's been a career now of of being a motivational speaker for a while now. So yeah, it's a combination of all the good things. <laughs> yes, and I, and I and like they say, right? You never really know. I I don't think I I ever um, thought of all these things ever happening in my life, right? Of ever getting into sports, of ever running professionally, of ever running into the Asian Games, of ever being a motivational yes. speaker. Yes. I think. Um, uh, things have just happened in my life, and I've uh, grabbed onto everything that's come yes. uh, my way, uh, way yeah. even without, even with the hands missing, yeah. I've managed to grab onto things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's a mentality we know, I guess. <laughs> Winning mentality. <laughs> good, good. So let's have a few rapid fire uh, round. A rapid. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Is, anyway, there a, is there a good hamper? <laughs> is there a gift hamper? Yes, yes. That's when we meet you personally. Oh. Because now it's virtual. Oh, okay. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to give you virtually. Very smart, huh? Very smart. Huh? At least you should show me the hamper, no? Like that in how Karan Johar shows on his show. Ki, this is the hamper you can win. <laughs> then only I'll tell you the answers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, your favorite uh, favorite restaurant in Bangalore? You being a Bangalore one. Oh, TV. no. That's, that's a tough one. There's just way too many things that I like. There are way too many things I like. Um, I like Paradise. I like um, I like China Pearl in Kormangla. Oh. I like um, I like a uh, rice bowl in uh, Laval Road. Oh, okay. um, uh, I love airlines. Um, I like Koshis. Uh, I like the thirteenth floor. I mean, I can go. I, I think we can stay on this call forever and tell you what all the places <laughs> I like. And then I also there used to be. I I also love the street food, so I like the. Um, the Thelewala Chinese and yeah. um, uh, fried rice. Uh, there used to be this guy in Indranagar uh -huh. uh, on Indranagar 100 feet road. Uh, there used to be this guy with this, you could go late night and eat uh, fried rice. And there's Anna Lakshmi um, uh, opposite to emphasis in uh, Alsur, that oh. again, small joint, great food. I mean, it was, it was Anna Lakshmi and we used to call it mm. Anna's Anna. in those times. But uh, yeah, so you know, anything I would, mm. yeah, any food, um, anywhere I will eat. I mean, I mean, with my training now, I don't, but like right, right. food yeah. is 
food is life life yeah yeah it's very mg yes. mg road dominated rice bowl and uh, your koshi yeah rice actually a lot of those places yeah a, a lot of those places are actually more nostalgia because yeah. you know as growing up being from bangalore yes. um rice bowl and all was one of the places that you went like years ago and one of the most happening places it's so dark that you can't see anything i mean of course it's refurbished now but yeah. just a lot of those places are just good memories i think true 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 yes it's yeah <laughs> The craziest thing that you would have done with your friends? Oh, that's a lot again, uh, as well. Uh, yes. I don't know how much of it I can say, but um, I think we used to do. I think the craziest thing. Some of the I don't know if they're crazy, but today in today's environment, they're almost borderline, um, very very unsafe to do. So I wouldn't recommend mm -hmm. anybody does it at this point in time. But we would do these really late night uh, car drives on the mm. outer ring road okay. and there were these small thelas at three o'clock mm -hmm. in the morning that yeah, we yeah. would have chai oh, okay. um, and there were just truck drivers around at that point in time I don't know what we were thinking and why we were thinking yeah, yeah. what we were doing yeah um, I think sometimes um, yeah I think those were some of the most craziest times because we would finish I worked I worked in the outsourcing space for oh. the largest part of my life oh, okay. Um, so you know night shifts were a part yeah. and parcel yeah. of mm -hmm. my life yeah, yeah. Um, so just getting out after your shift for a for for, for either we would go to MG Road Savera and have mm. coin paratha and chicken mm. and and chicken, mm. or then have a chai in one of these places. So um, I think those are some of the most um, I, I think today in retrospective kind of dangerous yes, things yes, to yes, do. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That uh, like like you said, you know, you didn't recommend at the same time. I mean, those are the times that we're going through. <laughs> yeah, true, true. Uh, a tricky question. Um, uh, maybe I'm trying to put you in a spot. Your best friend? Ah, uh, no. See, it's or a maybe group it's, of people. Uh, it's, it's, it's like an open book. I can, <laughs> no, I think... I, I, so, so my friends, uh, I've had friends. So I'm, I'm one of those very lucky people who've had friends from class one. Hmm. So my, my friend, that my best friend uh, from class one is Sapna. Uh, and hmm. uh, we're a group of uh, eight of us um, that have stuck together from school from class five onwards mm -hmm. um, and we're a bunch of women that have been through thick and thin of life so yeah. there's Sapna there's Usha there's Vani uh, there's Bina there's another Sapna and then there is Vanita um, and now I think there's an Anshu as well um, yeah. so I think um, uh, I just have I mean I, I think I've, I'm, I've been very lucky with my friendships in life yeah. so most of my friends that I have are people that have known from my teens so there's there's Prasanna there's Satish then there's yeah. people who have known all my lives and we're just a bunch of people that have held on to each other all my life so there's no tricky question of having one best friend I think there are I think that I think this is about it right like you have different friends for different things there are some things that you can yes, tell some nice, friends yeah nicely uh, and there are some things mm -hmm. that you tell other friends so I think for me I'm very lucky that I've had all kinds of all friends, kinds of friends, that friends I can to cover share. up everything yeah yeah true, true, true. yeah, yeah. True, yeah. True, true. Thank you so much, Shalini, uh, for all okay. yeah, yeah for, for all the beautiful stories that you have, and um, uh, uh, and uh, wish you all the best for the rest of your journey. Thank and you. uh, stay yourself. And uh, by default, of course, your positive energy only inspires. So not that you have to try too hard <laughs> to make to inspire anybody <laughs> else. It's just that uh, you doing your own stuff for yourself it, in itself is a, a big story for others. And uh, uh, you have already inspired me, of course. And that's why I, I made sure that you come here on, on in my interview. I didn't leave you. I still remember I, I tried once, uh, I think one year back, uh, somehow couldn't bring you. And then I've also been, you know, tenacious. I think we chatted with each other. Yes, yes, yes. Time, on, right? on Insta and all. Yes, yes. But yeah. I've been tenacious enough uh, to finally bring you on board. And yes. I th thank my stars for that. Thank you so much, Shalini. And keep doing... Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Shalini. Thank you so much. And uh, keep on doing uh, the things that you are you have been doing and uh, stay true to yourself and be yourself. Thanks, Shalini.